As we look at this overview of Fort Jaron taken from the uh, top of the post office, uh, looking north, we can see uh, the courthouse, and to the left of that, uh, to the far left, we can see the tower from the fire uh, department. And a little closer to the foreground, we can see uh, two of the gas tanks from the uh, gas company in Fort Jaron. As interesting as this is, uh, this isn't why I'm showing you the picture. I'm showing you this photograph uh, to actually show you a building that's set directly across from the post office, and that is the White Building. In a booklet uh, put out in 1897, this is what it says about the White Building. The White Building was erected in 1892 by James H. White and Al A. Sherman. The block is one of the most complete office buildings in the state. It is steam heat and lighted with both electricity and gas. It has a passenger elevator and water on every floor. Society Hall and a large law library are located there. Of course, when you have a law library, you have attorneys. And of course, you have uh, many uh, rooms available for attorneys in this size building. And not only attorneys, but you had doctors, you had dentists, and you had some unique businesses as well, such as the Flint Pantaloon Company that made pantaloons. If you're like me, you think pantaloons, you think of this picture right here. But this picture here is probably uh, more in line with what they were making at the time, which is basically men's breeches. Another unique business that was located there was the Robeson Preservo Company, which was a, a company that uh, made waterproof canvases. They had contracts with the government for those canvases and greatly uh, assisted the government uh, during the war effort. Another business that was located there was that of Miss Rose Sullivan. She had a sonography and bookkeeping school there and uh, you can read this at your leisure. And of course, there was retail businesses located there as well, as you can see from this advertisement for the R&W Shoe Company. Women's Pumps and Men's Oxfords. Low price Oxford at that. The largest retailer that uh, was located at the White Building was the Howard Furniture Company. And here's an advertisement for them, you can see uh, we will furnish your house complete from cellar to garret. Now there's a word you don't hear every day, garret. With the finest goods in the country. And you also see they came out with cash or credit. And credit wasn't uh, too uh, available in those days. So it was probably a pretty big deal at that time. And I imagine the company that paid for that particular ad was the Regal Universal Stove Company. And that gives you a picture of one of their popular models. In this early photograph of Water Street, looking east uh, down Water Street, you can see the federal building with the fountain there on the right. But that tall building on the left in the foreground would be the white building. And as we zoom in on the upper left-hand corner, we can see signage for the Howard Furniture Company. And thanks to a photograph from the T.J. Gaffney collection, we can see all Howard Furniture delivered their furnitures back in those days. A very early picture of one of their uh, delivery vehicles. Later on, they would have a fleet of the latest and greatest delivery vehicles. As you can see, these are much newer. And as you can see from this advertisement, uh, they were a very popular uh, business in Fort Jern. They had two big locations, as you can see from the bottom right-hand corner of this ad. Two big stores, the White Block on Water Street and the Bear Block on Huron Avenue. And here's a photograph of their other store. This store was located in the same block as the Maccabee Building and later on the Alicantin Hotel. The Hour Furniture Store that you see here used to be the Port and Armory at one time. Later on, they would have a store located on Military Street, the 900 block. And you can see from this ad here, the new Howard Furniture Company. You can also see by this ad that they had a factory where they made uh, a lot of their own furniture, uh, 333 Water Street. That would have been east of Military Street. 
Here's a photograph of their military street store. And this is a store that many of my generation remember. This is the one that I certainly remember. And it was there for a long time. The white building was a very impressive building, if for no other reason than size. But like so many buildings in Port Sharon, it was destroyed by fire. Here you can see the fire department in the foreground, and of course the fire in the background of the white building. Uh, you can look right through the windows and see how bright it is. Here's a shot from a little further away. Looking from the riverside, you can see how completely destroyed that building is. It also appears that more of the rear of the building was destroyed than the front. In this photograph here, you can see that the white building or block, as it was known, is just a shell of its former self. But that shell had to come down, and you can see the crane there uh, starting to work on it. And they had to be very careful, because when those walls came down, they had to be careful they didn't uh, damage the adjoining buildings. Ironically, the uh, location where the other uh, Howard uh, Furniture Store was located on Huron Avenue was also destroyed by fire. These pictures also gives us an idea of what the fire equipment was uh, during that time period. You can see the ladder truck here and, and also in this photograph here as well. The ladder company in the fire department was stationed right around the corner from them behind the courthouse, so it wouldn't have taken them very long to get there. Of course, it doesn't look like it did it much good. The white block was no more, but as you can see from this sign, they built another building there. We erect new building on this site for responsible tenants. If you're not responsible, you need not apply. And you can see they're already doing work on the bottom level. It looks like they're putting in new walls. And if you look carefully through these upper windows, you can see the businesses and stores on the opposite side of the river. No walls to hinder the view. Eventually a building was built there. I'm not sure if it was two separate buildings or if it was one large building. But with the facade on here, you can't really tell. But uh, this, uh, where the rectangle is, that's basically where the white building used to be. And uh, Fletcher's Beef uh, Buffet was in that first section. I'm not sure what was in the second one. I don't have a directory of that current. I can't quite make out the sign. Some of you might know, though. Here we see an evening shot of that same location. All right, let's go on to the next building. Uh, in order to do that, I have to bring this picture up again, because if you notice, the next building that was next to the white building that's being torn down is a very small building, and it sits between the two taller buildings. Uh, most of the folks uh, from my generation remember this as a pool hall or a billiard hall, and it was a plaza uh, pool hall, uh, back in my time anyway. And before that, uh, it was uh, under different names, but it was a uh, billiard hall, a billiard room for many, many years. But years before it was a billiard hall, it was something else. If you look at the left, that building, that taller building to your left, it's a very distinct, uh, unique design. And you can see it in this picture here. This is a much older picture, but because of the unique design, we're able to identify that building. But more important, we're able to identify what was next door to it, uh, to the east, in that small space that we saw between the two buildings. And that was this fire hall. And this was Port Erin's first fire hall, one that I wasn't even aware of. It was built about 1967. And of course, at that time, they didn't have a full... Uh, full-time fire department and all they had was a volunteer fire department later on uh, it would be a part-time fire department that would occupy this building. Port Yarn didn't have a full-time fire department until 1900. Prior to this uh, back in the 1860s 
Poirier was protected from the ravages of fire by an organization known as the Eagle Hose Company. It was made up of a group of volunteers who were engaged in other various trades or businesses in the town, but who responded to the alarm in case of fire. They were a group of young men who took great pride in their organization and their duties as firefighters. In those days, it was considered a matter of community service to belong to this group, whose activities were social as well as civic. And in this photo, you can see the volunteer fire department with their hose cart. Prior to this, everything was dependent upon the bucket brigade. Every home had a bucket. Some had more than one bucket. It uh, was determined by the risk of fire. Businesses had more. For example, a baker had to have three buckets and a brewer had to have six buckets on hand in case of fires. Bucket brigades were used commonly, which consisted of two lines of people stretching from the town well to the fire. They passed buckets of water to the fire and the empty buckets back to the well to be refilled. The owners of the buckets would have their names painted on them so they could get them back to, after the fire. If there weren't enough people to pass the buckets, they used a little bit of ingenuity, as you can see from this drawing here. When the volunteer fire department came into existence, they chose a foreman. And that foreman was in charge of the fire scene, and he always carried a trumpet, or at least most of the time carried a trumpet. And that trumpet was used to uh, shout out orders uh, during the fire. In the 1860s, modern technology, at least modern for that time, uh, they came up with this uh, pump cart. It was a hand pump cart and it would pump the water to the fire so that they weren't in danger of uh, getting burnt themselves by getting close enough to the fire to throw the water with a pail. And this was a vast improvement. And you would think that this would eliminate the, the bucket brigade, but it didn't. The water still had to come from someplace. Now, if they were lucky and near a river or a creek, uh, they could just put the hose in there and pump it up. But most of the time, that wasn't the case. They would have to uh, get the water from a well, and the hose, of course, wouldn't reach. So they would depend upon the bucket brigade to bring the, the water and fill it into the uh, container that they had within the hand pump cart and sometimes they had a larger container outside the car they would dump the water in. But they had to keep that water supplied in order to have uh, a good supply of water for the fire. One of the things I was amused by is that the container in this cart had uh, a strainer of uh, 5 8 half inch holes so that when they ran a hose to the river or a creek that it would strain out the fish or snakes. Well, after 119 videos, most of you know me pretty well, and you know I've got an inquisitive mind. I like to see how things work, and I want to see how effective this piece of uh, machinery was for the fire department, and uh, what kind of a spray that it shot out there. Uh, was it worth the, uh, the effort put toward, and how hard was it to get the water pressure up? And so I found this video that I'm going to show here in a second. This shows a modern day fire department using the old time fire equipment. And it's pretty interesting. Okay, here you see one of the original hand pumpers uh, being, that has been restored, making the connection here. And uh, this is a container that they would put the water, this is the type of container that the bucket brigade would put water in, or in some of the later models, they would put it right in the hand pumper itself. Right, now they're putting the hose in to, to get the water for the pumper and now it's going to take a lot of physical exercise more than I thought uh, it would take but uh, they have like eight guys on each side and they're pumping for all they're worth but uh, it's really amazing uh, the effect the water coming out look at this here see that water spray that must be like three stories high that's amazing when you stop to think they went from throwing buckets of water uh, on uh, a house to be able to do something like this, so a vast improvement. Another source of water supply for uh, the firemen when they were putting out fires was when the cities had uh, water mains, uh, water pipes, they were originally made out of wood. Uh, this is a picture of some here that had been dug up. And uh, when they had these, of course, what they could do is they could go down 
wherever the water line was. The firemen would go down, they would dig a hole, expose the uh, wood and main, and uh, punch a hole in it, or bore a hole in it, uh, usually. And then, of course, that hole would fill with water, and that's where they would get their water supply, and then they would put a plug in it when they were done, and usually mark where that plug was in case they needed it again. And that's where uh, the term for fire hydrant originally were called fire plugs. When I was growing up, that's what we called them. You don't hear it much anymore, but uh, fire plugs uh, were basically fire hydrants. Well, we have much more of the early fire departments in Fort Huron, much more than this video will contain. So we'll uh, continue on in our next video, number 120. So I'll look forward to seeing you then.